list terms of finite sequences or list n terms of infinite sequences. Well, one way to define a sequence is that it's an ordered list of numbers. Another way to define it, it's a function whose domain is the set of positive integers. So if I take a look at this sequence 2, 4, 6, or 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, you can say, well, what could it represent? Maybe a website starts. And on the first day of the month, they get two hits. Second day, four hits. And they keep doubling the number of hits for, say, 31 days. If you were going to write out this sequence, you would write out the terms, much like we have here. And just for notation, we would say the first term would be a sub 1. And that would be 2. Second term would be a sub 2. And the third term would be a sub 3. And so on. And so very quickly, we see if we look at the subscript, we can see which term we have. Well, this is where the notion of a function with a domain of positive integers come in. I can call my function a sub n equals 2 to the n. We use a real different notation. Like you and I are used to f of x equals 2 to the x. That's when x is any real number. But with sequences, to alert the reader that you have a sequence, you don't do the of x like that. You go a sub n. Oh, it's a sequence. Now, when you go ahead and find the formula of the sequence, you want to say that formula is going to be set up in a very specific way. And that way is where the first term is going to be governed by putting that input of 1 into your function. And 2 to the first is what? 2 to the first is? 2. 2. And so if we see if this formula works, we would then put a 2 into the input area of the function. We get back what? We get back? 4. 4. And if we put a 3 in, we end up with what? 2, two cubed, which is what? Which is? Which is 8. Which is 8. And it does seem to work just fine. This website was doing pretty well because by the 31st day, I guess we'd substitute in a 31, and they were getting about 2.1 G billion hits. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, so it <laughs> may not be practical, but, but, but here's the thing. We want to look at two types of sequences. One is finite, one is infinite. And when I look at a finite sequence, a finite sequence is nothing more than a sequence whose domain is the set of the first n positive integers. In other words, your domain would be 1, 2, 3, out to 5 or something. And that would generate 5 outputs, like we see right here, finite. The actual numbers that you see, the 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, these are the terms of the sequence. And we don't really call it a function. We say the explicit formula defines the nth term. It may sound messy, but we use that terminology with sequences instead of functions. And lastly, we could have an infinite sequence that continues out forever. And we show that by just putting dot, dot, dot. Let's see if you got it. Spot quiz, kiddo. All right? <laughs> what we're going to do, we is you, right? We is you. We're going to go ahead and see if we can list the first five terms of this sequence and I'm going to do the first, and you're going to do the next four. b sub 1 is found by taking 3 times, and n here is 1, so 3 times 1 plus 4. And that's what? That's? 7. 7. And what I need to make you aware is that we're just substituting in that subscript for where we see n in the formula. Substituting in that subscript for where we see n in the formula. That's all we're doing. Okay. I do 1, you do 4. That sounds fair to me. So if I go ahead and take a look at b sub 2, what would the calculation look like? It would be 3 times 2 plus 4. Very good. And so that's, I want to say that's 6 plus 4, which is? 10. 10. How about b sub 3? What would that be? That would be 3 times 3 plus 4. Very good. And that would be what? That would be? 13. 13. And you can kind of eyeball the rest of them. b sub 4 would be 3 times what? 3 times? 3 times 4 plus 4. Very good. And that would be? That would be... 17. Okay. So, yeah, because it would be 12, 12 plus 4? 16. Very good. <laughs> and the very last one would be 3 times what? 3 times? 3 times 5 plus, plus four. 4. 15 and 4 is? 19. So there are the first five terms, and I would list them as terms. Bracy, that's how you list them. 7, 10, 13, 16, 19. You'd list them. Finite or infinite sequence? Uh, finite. Finite. Let's do one more. What's factorial mean? What's factorial mean? What's factorial mean? If I say 3 factorial, what are you multiplying? Um, I'm not sure. It's 3, and then you start subtracting by 1 times 2, subtract 1 until you get the 1. So 3 factorial, well, that'd be 3 times 2 times 1. 5 factorial, well, that would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 10 factorial would be 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. 
times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So what we're going to do again is list the first five terms. I'll do 1 and uh, you do 4. That sounds fair. C sub 1. 1 factorial. That's just 1. Okay. All over 1 squared plus 1. Again, what are we doing? We're taking this right here, which is the subscript 1, and we're placing it where we see the n. That's what we're doing. Just like function notation. And the hardest part is evaluating it, but this is just 1 plus 1, which is... Would that be 1 over 2? 1 half. Very good. There's my first term. C sub 2. What does the calculation look like? Would it be um, 2 factorial? Good. Over... Over 2 squared plus 1. Very good. So 2 factorial, that's 2 times 1. 2 squared plus 1 is 4 plus 1, which is 5. There's my second term. For the third term, what would the calculation look like? Because that's what's key here. That would be 3 factorial. Very good. Over what? Over what? Over, over. 3 squared plus 1. Very good. Now, 3 factorial is 3 times 2. And 3 squared plus 1 is 9 plus 1. I want to say this third one is 3 fifths. Yeah. Basically, we're done here. How about the fourth term? What would the calculation look like? 4 factorial over 4 squared plus 1. Very good. 4 times 3 is 12. And 12 times 2 is 24, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we have 24 over 16 plus 1. And for the very fifth term, that would be what? That would be? 5 factorial. Over what? Over, over. 5 squared plus 1. Very good. And 5 factorial would be 24 times 5, basically, which is 120, all over 25 plus 1, 26. And if I divide them both by 2, I get 60 over 13. Easiest question of the day. I want to write these five terms. I put a what? I put a, what is that thing called? A bracket? Um, almost. A bra S braces? Bracey, good. Bracey. And the first term is? <laughs> uh, one half. Second term? Two fifths. Third term? Three fifths. Fourth term? 24 over 17. And then we'll just write in the last term, which I know is 60 over 13. Thank you. Let's write out the first five terms of the sequence defined by the explicit formula shown below. And the formula is a sub n is equal to negative 3n plus 8. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and substitute in values for n of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we'll find the corresponding first, second, third, fourth, and fifth term respectively. So let's begin. When n is equal to 1, this will enable us to find a sub 1, which is our first term. We'll take negative 3 times that same 1 plus 8. And that's negative 3 plus 8, which is 5. Well, when n is 2, this will enable us to find a sub 2, which means we'll take negative 3 times n, which in this case is 2, plus 8. And that's negative 6 plus 8, which is 2. Moving on, when n equals 3, this will enable us to find a sub 3, which is our third term. So the calculation would be negative 3 times that same 3, plus 8. And that's negative 9 plus 8, which is negative 1. When n is 4, this will enable us to find a sub 4. The calculation would be negative 3 times that same 4 plus 8. And that gives us the calculation of negative 12 plus 8, which is negative 4. Rounding out our fifth term, n would be equal to 5. This will enable us to calculate a sub 5. We'll take negative 3 times that same 5 plus 8. And that's negative 15 plus 8, which is negative 7. Writing as a sequence of terms, we put a bracy, And we'll write the first term as 5. Second term is 2. Third term, negative 1. Fourth term, negative 4. Fifth term is negative 7. Find terms of recursive sequences. Sequences like this Fibonacci sequence occur in nature. They will occur in growth patterns of things like nautilus shells, pine cones, and tree branches. 
Did you know that the longest pine cone ever was like 22.9 inches? Uh, actually, no, I didn't. Yeah. It seems like it should be larger. That's like... All right, maybe not. All right. <laughs> The way this Fibonacci sequence is constructed is differently, is, is constructed different than what we've seen in the past. What we do is we base a term on the previous term or terms. In other words, to construct the Fibonacci sequence, I start with one and one, and then I add one and one to get the next term, which is two. Then I add one and two to get the next term, which is three, and add two and three to get the next term, which is five, and so on. So what is diagnostic about this type of sequence is that it is based on the initial term or terms. You could be given more than one. Those have to be given to you. And some equation that enables you to use these preceding term or terms. And this type of sequence is called a recursive sequence. So we want to write the first ter five terms of this sequence defined recursively. So I have to give you a starting point. I could give you one or more, but I give you a starting point. Here the starting point is what? Go ahead and look up there. A1 is? Three. All right, so I know my first term is 3. Then when I take a look at when I have my formula, what I'm seeing for the nth term, what I'll do is I'll take 2 times the previous term, n minus 1, and then simply subtract 1. And I'll do this for n greater than or equal to 2. In other words, I'll start on the second term. So let's go ahead and generate the first five terms. A1 we know, first term is our starting point, that's what, that's? That's 3. 3. Now the way this works is A2 becomes the second term. And the way the formula works, it says take 2 times the previous term, which is A1, and subtract 1. So that would be 2 times what? 2 times? 2 times 3. Very good, minus 1, which is? Uh, 6 minus 1, that's what, that's? 5. 5, good. Well, let's go ahead and generate the next three terms in a like manner. For A3, again, I'll take 2 times the preceding term, which is A2, and subtract 1. So I just go to the preceding term and substitute it in for A2, and the preceding term is? 5. So I have 2 times 5 minus 1, and that's what? That's? 9. 9, very good. 10 minus 1. I'm up to the fourth term. I'll take 2 times the preceding term. That'd be A what? A sub? A sub 3. Minus 1. And then I'll substitute in A sub 3, which we just found to be? To be 9. So I have 2 times what? 2 times? 2 times 9 minus 1. And what is that? That's what? That's? Uh, 17. Beautiful. And finally, we get up to the very last term, and the very last term is the fifth term. So the fifth term is found by taking 2 times which term? 2 times the? 17. Well, the preceding term, which would be the? Oh, that would be a uh, sub 4. a sub 4 minus 1, and you'll substitute in for a sub 4 now. 17. 17. And 2 times 17 minus 1 is? Thirty-three. Beautiful. So when we write out our first five terms, we can do that. We'd write the first term, which is what? Which is? Three. Three. Second term, which is? Five. Third term, which is? Nine. Fourth term, which is? Seventeen. And the last term, which is? Thirty-three. Beautiful. Thank you. Let's write an explicit formula for the nth term of a sequence. So the first sequence has the terms negative two elevenths, three thirteenths, negative 4 fifteenths, 5 seventeenths, negative 6 nineteenths, and so on. Now, we'll begin by looking for a pattern, and there are actually three patterns that we notice. The first is just noticing in the numerator that the values go from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. Now, each of these numbers will be one more than the previous number. So what does that is 1 times n. So then I think to myself, if n is 1, 1 plus something is 2. If n is 2, 2 plus something is 3. If n is 3, 3 plus something is 4. So I think to myself, what would that value have to be? Well, 1 plus 1, 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1 would give me 2, 3, 4. So the first pattern I recognize is that I generate the numerator by the expression n plus 1. Now let me look at the denominator. For the denominator, each of these 
terms 11, 13, 15, 17, 19 differ by 2. So what does that is 2 times n. So let me look at the 11. 2 times 1 plus a number equals 11. Let me look at the 13. 2 times 2 plus a number is 13. Let me look at the 15. 2 times 3 plus a number is 15. What does that number have to be to generate each of these denominators exactly? Well, 2 plus 9 is 11, 4 plus 9 is 13, 6 plus 9 is 15. So it looks like the denominator is generated by the expression 2n plus 9. The very last thing I need to do is to be able to alternate the terms of the sequence and they need to alternate from negative to positive to negative. So what does this is a multiplier. If I take negative 1, I'll either raise it to the n or the n plus 1. If I raise it to the n, when n is 1, the first term is negative. When n is 2, the second term is positive. So there is my multiplier. Now I can go ahead and write out the explicit formula for the nth term of this sequence. The explicit formula for the sequence a sub n is equal to negative 1 to the n times n plus 1 and divided by 2n plus 9. Now let me turn to the second sequence, which has the terms negative 2 over 25, negative 2 over 125, negative 2 over 625, negative 2 over 3125, negative 2 over 15,625. And again, we're looking for patterns. And again, I'm looking for three patterns. Let me look in the numerator first. I notice all of my numerators are the numbers 2. So I know I'll put a 2 in my numerator. Now let me look in the denominator. I notice all of my 2's seem to re be the result of taking 5 to some exponent. 25, well that's 5 squared. 125 is 5 cubed. 625 is 5 to the 4th and so on. So now I realize my common theme is that I have a base of 5 and the exponents 2, 3, and 5 differ by 1. So I know that 1n will make each of these terms differ by 1. So I think to myself, 1 plus what number is 2? And then I go to the second term. 2 plus what number is 3? Go to the third term. 3 plus what number is 4? And I very quickly realize that number is 1. So my denominator is generated by a base of 5 raised to the n plus 1. Last pattern may be the easiest to ascertain. Notice each of these terms is negative. So each of these terms will be a negative number. So let's go ahead and write out the explicit formula for the nth term of the sequence. We have b sub n is equal to, and again all the terms are negative, the numerator is always a 2, and the denominator is 5 raised to the n plus 1. Find explicit formulas for the nth term of a sequence. What we're going to do is we're going to take a sequence, which we know is a function. The domain is the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And we're going to go ahead and see if we can start with the terms and end up with the actual formula, the explicit formula that would generate the terms. And because we do have a function here, if we took a look at 2, 4, 6, we have to imagine what would we have to do to generate a 2, 4, 6 if we put the inputs 1, 2, 3 into some function. Well, in this case, it's pretty easy. You're just kind of doubling those numbers. Yeah. So that means my explicit formula, a sub n, is equal to 2 times n. So when we do this type of thought process, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. And the questions are, do the terms differ by the same amount? Like here, they differ by 3. Or is there a number you can multiply by to get from one term to the next? 
things you're looking for to generate the function's formula? Do you see evidence of perfect squares or perfect cubes? Are there alternating signs, plus minus plus? If there are fractions, you'll generate a formula for the numerator and denominator differently. That means you'll generate a function by looking at the numerator with one expression and the denominator with another. And again, if the terms all have exponents or bases, can you find a pattern there as well? So the very first type of sequence I see has 10, 13, 16, and what strikes me is that all these numbers differ by by three. By three. So three times one is three. Three times two is six. Three times three is nine. You're probably thinking, very good, Jay. But, <laughs> but what I'm driving at is start by saying, okay, a sub n is three times n. And then ask yourself, if I go ahead and put a one into this calculation for n, what number would I have to add or subtract here to generate the 10? And that number would be what? It would be? Uh, seven. Seven. Very good. So that fills in the rest of the formula, doesn't it? 3n plus 7 is equal to a n. Look at the third term. Let's do a quick check. We're not that busy. You look at the third term and you say, gosh, if I go ahead and substitute in a 3 for n, and then I add 7, that's 9 plus 6. That's what? That's? That's 16. As it should be. You look at b sub n and you say that's nearly the exact same situation. It's just you have alternating signs. So when you have alternating signs, the thought process is to first generate the formula, which we did. That's 3n plus 7. And that will generate the absolute values of the terms, the 10, the 13, the 16. Then to alternate the sign, to go from positive to negative and back again, you multiply by either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n minus 1. And the way you decide which one it is is by looking at the first term. In this case, the first term is positive. positive. So negative 1 to the n would give me negative 1 to the first for the first term, which is negative. But negative 1 to the 1 minus 1 would give me negative 1 to the 0, which is positive. So this tells me my exponent will be, I'm just going to write this in right here, negative 1 raised to the n minus 1. Now we want to go ahead and take a look at terms and generate the explicit formulas, and we're going to be seeing 4, 9, 16 in the very first sequence. These are what? These are perfect squares. squares. And the only thing we have to be careful of is that we want to put a 1 into the calculation, yet it looks like we want a square 2. We want to put a 2 into the calculation, yet we want a square 3. We want to put a 3 into the calculation, yet we want a square 4. So what are we looking at doing? every time we put a 1, 2, and 3 into the calculation. Would you add a 1? We'd add a 1 before we would square it. Very good. For the last of these sequences, I want to realize that I have three pieces of information to look at. First is I have alternating signs. When you have alternating signs again, you're going to multiply by either negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n minus 1. And the way you make the decision is you say that first term, is it positive or negative? The first term is negative. Very good. When that's the case, remember you're substituting a 1 for n. Negative 1 to the first is negative 1. So that begins d sub n. d sub n is equal to negative 1 to the n. Then I'm going to draw a fraction bar. So we're just going to ask ourselves, if n is 1, I want an output of a 1. If n is 2, I want an output of a 2. If n is 3, I want an output of a 3. What would the numerator be? Would it just be n? n would just be that value. And for 5, 10, 17, I'd say, well, gosh, what's the pattern here? Do they differ by the same amount? No. No. And if I was to give you a big old hint, I'd probably say something like, have you seen numbers close to them before? 5, 4, 10, 9, 17, 16. Yeah. Yeah. These numbers, 5, 10, and 17, are all one more than? Than being a square. Than being that 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared. Mm -hmm. So all we do is we take our formula to generate 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, which was what, which was what, which was? Um, n plus 1 squared. And we just add what, add? And then just add 1. Add 1 to it. Thank you.
Write the first five terms of the sequence defined by the recursive formula shown below. a sub 1 equals 9. a sub n is equal to 3 times a sub n minus 1 minus 20. And this is for values of n greater than or equal to 2. Now with the recursive formula, what you have to realize is that for any given term, a sub n, a sub n minus 1 refers to the term before a sub n. So we can start listing the first five terms immediately. We know a sub 1 is equal to 9. a sub 2 is equal to 3 times the term before it, a sub 1, minus 20. Well, the term before it is 9, so I have 3 times 9 minus 20, and that's 27 minus 20, which is 7. Well, for the third term, a sub 3, this is 3 times the term before it, a sub 2, minus 20, which would be 3 times, now the term before a sub 3 was a 7, minus 20, and that gives us 21 minus 20, which is 1. Let's go to the fourth term. This would be equal to 3 times a sub 3, the third term, minus 20. This is 3 times the third term, which is a 1, minus 20. And 3 minus 20 is negative 17. We get to the fifth term, a sub 5. This is 3 times a sub 4, the term before the fifth, minus 20, which is 3 times now, the term before the fifth term is the fourth term. That's negative 17. So 3 times negative 17 minus 20. And this gives us negative 51 minus 20, which is negative 71. So if I want to write out my first five terms, I can do that. I would have 9, 7, 1, negative 17, and negative 71. These would be the first five terms of the sequence defined by the recursive formula that is shown below. Write formulas for the nth term of arithmetic sequences and find some indicated terms. An arithmetic sequence, this is when the terms can be found by beginning with the first term and then adding a common difference over and over again repeatedly. So to see this, if I wrote down my first term, that would be 6. My second term would be 10, that's 6 plus 4. My third term would be 14, that would be 6 plus 4 plus 4. And what I do to check if I have an arithmetic sequence is I see if I'm adding the same number over and over again to get from one term to the next term. And I am, I'm adding 4 over and over again. And I'm sure you could see a pattern here, which is that with this third term, I start with my first term 6, and then I take my 4 that I'm adding to each term and multiplying it by 3 minus 1, or 2. And this is my formula for an arithmetic sequence. What you do is you take the first term, a sub 1, and you add to it that common difference, that number you're adding over and over, and that's that 4. Okay, so that's my common difference multiplied by one less than the term you're at. So multiplied by n minus 1. Well, what I want to do is see if I can find the nth term, which is just the formula, for any arithmetic sequence, and then see if I can use it to find the 20th term. The very first thing I'm going to do is go over to the corner here and just write down a sub n, which is the nth term, is equal to a sub 1 plus n minus 1d. Now to find the nth term, what does that mean to you and I? Well, that just means I'm finding a formula for a sub n. So I highlight my first term. My first term, that'd be 12, right? Yeah. I take a look at my common difference. Well, what number am I adding 
to a term to get to the next term? Five. Five. Twelve plus five is seventeen. Seventeen plus five is twenty-two. And that's called my what? My? Your common difference. Common difference. Very good. And n is just a variable. So when I actually write out my formula, a sub n is equal to my first term, which is what? Which is? Twelve. Twelve plus n minus one times what? Times? Times five. Times five. Very good. Which I can clean it up. A sub n is equal to 12 plus 5n minus 5. And 12 minus 5 is 7. So I guess a sub n is equal to 7 plus 5n. And if I'd like to find the 20th term, which is what I need to do, I'll just substitute in what? I'll substitute in a... A 20 for n. So I have 7 plus 5 times 20. And that gives me, I want to say, 107. I do want to take a look at two more. The reason why we're looking at this one is for the very first step, which is when we decide if we really have an arithmetic difference. So I'm going to go ahead and write down my formula. a sub n is equal to a sub 1 plus n minus 1d. I'm going to go through the checklist I went through a moment ago. What's my first term? 10. 10. What number am I adding? to get from 10 to negative 6? Um, to get from 10 to 6, it would be negative 4. That's what you're actually adding to it. Very good. To get from 6 to 2, what would it be? Negative 4. Very good. What's my common difference? Negative 4. Very good. So now I have a sub n is equal to a sub 1, which is? 10. Plus n minus 1 times what? Times? Times negative 4. And I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. That's a sub n is equal to 10. I want to say minus 4n plus 4. So I'll rewrite this as a sub n is equal to? 6. Let's see, 10 plus 4 is? Oh, 14. 14 minus? Minus 4n. 4n. And I want to find what? I want to find the? The 20th term. Very good. So to find the 20th term, I just substitute in a 20 for n. Mm -hmm. And I get 14 minus 4 times 20. Now, 4 times 20 is 80. I got mm -hmm. 14 minus 80. I want to say that's negative what? Negative? 66. 66. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, I think so. Last one. Fractions. I know what you're thinking. I love this stuff, but where are the fractions? <laughs> Same set of sentences, though, ladies and gentlemen. a sub n is equal to a sub 1 plus n minus 1d. We look at the first term. We know the first term, right? First term is what? First term is? Negative one-third. Negative one-third. We look at a common difference. What number are we adding to go from negative one-third to zero, to go from zero to one-third? We're adding what? We're adding? One-third. One-third every time. Very good. So right here is where we'll put one-third. And that's all we do. We have a sub n is equal to a sub one, which is what? Which is? Negative one-third. Good. Plus n minus one times what? Times? Times one-third. Very good. And to clean this up a little bit, it looks worse than it is. It's negative a third plus one-third n, and then minus one-third. That's just a sub n, which is equal to one-third n. I think you wrote one-half. Ooh, good catch. Are you looking right here? Yeah. <laughs> Let me make that change. Thank you. Let me make that change in highlighter mode. There we go. So now it looks like we have one-third n minus what? Minus... Two-thirds. Two-thirds. And we want to find the 20th term. We can do that. We'll just substitute in what for n? 20. 20. So a sub 20 is equal to one-third times what? Times? Times 20. Minus two-thirds. And that's just 80 over 3 minus 2 over 3. And that would be 78 over 3. Thank you. Is each sequence arithmetic? If so, find the common difference. If a sequence is arithmetic, then that sequence will have a common difference. We find the common difference by subtracting any two consecutive terms. All consecutive terms should have the same common difference. If I take 2 minus 1, I get 1. If I take 4 minus 2, I get 2. I can stop at this point because I do not have the same difference between consecutive terms, this sequence is not arithmetic. Let's check out the next sequence. 
1 minus a negative 3 is 1 plus 3. That's 4. 5 minus 1 is 4. 9 minus 5 is 4. 13 minus 9 is 4. Notice all of these differences are the same. We do have a common difference here. That common difference is 4. So to answer our question, we have an arithmetic sequence. And what is the common difference? The common difference is 4. Let's find the first five terms of the arithmetic sequence where a sub 1 equals 17 and d equals negative 3. So with our formula for an arithmetic sequence, we know that a sub n is equal to a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d. So if I'm writing the first five terms, I begin with a sub 1, which is given to me. That's 17. To find a sub 2, I take the first term, 17, plus, now n is 2, plus 2 minus 1 times the common difference, which is negative 3. Well, this is 17 minus 3, which is 14. To find the third term, I take a sub 3, so here n is 3, and that's equal to 17 plus n minus 1, 3 minus 1, times negative 3. So that's 17 plus negative 6, and that's 11. To find the fourth, fourth term, which is a sub 4, I take 17 plus, and now we see the pattern, 4 minus 1 times negative 3 which is 17 plus 3 times negative 3, so that's 17 minus 9, and that's 8. And to find the fifth term, I take 17 plus, now that we see the pattern again, I write n minus 1, or 5 minus 1, times the common difference, negative 3. So that's 17 plus 4 times negative 3, that's 17 plus a negative 12, and that's 5. And I have my first five terms, which is 17, 14, 11, 8, and 5. Notice, with the first term, what I did was I added the common difference to each term to get the next term down the line. Let us write a recursive formula for the arithmetic sequence. Negative 18, negative 7, 4, 15, 26, and so on. For recursive formula, what we'll do is we'll specify a sub 1 as the first term. And then we'll go ahead and write a sub n is equal to a sub n minus 1 plus d. And what this means is that for any given term, we use the reference nth term, a sub n minus 1 would be the previous term. And we'd add to that whatever that common difference would be with my arithmetic sequence. So for my first term, I see that's negative 18, so I will write a sub 1 is equal to negative 18. And then I'll write a sub n, the nth term, is equal to a sub n minus 1, the preceding term, plus the common difference. Well, to find the common difference, what I'll do is simply go to any two consecutive terms, like negative 7 and negative 18. And with negative 7 being the second term and negative 18 being the first term, I'll simply subtract, taking the second term minus the first term. Well, negative 7 minus a negative 18 is negative 7 plus 18. That's 11. And that seems to check just fine. If I take negative 18, if I add 11 to it, I do get that second term of negative 7. And then to further check, if I take negative 7 and add the common difference, Notice that I get a positive 4, and that's what I should get. 
So this tells me I found my common difference of 11. So that will finish out my recursive formula. I will have a sub n is equal to a sub n minus 1 plus 11. So with this recursive formula, I've specified the first term, and then I've specified if I'm at any given term, how to get to the next term. Write an explicit formula for the arithmetic sequence 2, 12, 22, 32, 42. The explicit formula is a n is equal to a 1 plus d times n minus 1. Now recall, the input is n and the output is a n. So this means I need to find the common difference, d, and the first term, a1. To find the common difference, I pick any two terms that are consecutive, and I'll pick 22 and 32 and subtract. 32 minus 22 is 10. This is my common difference. My first term, well, my first term is 2. Substituting in, I find a n is equal to the first term, 2, plus the common difference, 10, times the quantity n minus 1. Now let's distribute the 10. So we have a n is equal to 2 plus 10 n minus 10. In combining terms, we have a n is equal to 10 n minus 8. Here is my explicit formula. Solve applications involving arithmetic sequences and or series. What we have to do is give you an application and have you distinguish, is the sequence that's represented arithmetic? And the way you tell that is, do you see evidence of a common difference? And then the question being asked, is it asking for a particular term of the sequence? Or are you adding up all the numbers in the sequence and having a sum? So for this question, a student walks into a nearly filled classroom shaped like an amphitheater she notices in the first row there are eight chairs and then in each subsequent row there are two more chairs. She counts 26 rows. Now before we go even further, if we create a sequence a sub n where it's the number of students in each row, in row one there's eight chairs, in row two there are two more chairs so we can end up with ten chairs for ten students. And that pattern continues all the way until we get to the very last row right here. And there are going to be 26 of these numbers. Each number represents what? The number of students in that row. Mm -hmm. Is this arithmetic? I don't know. To go from 8 to 10, I differ by? 2. To go from 10 to 12, I differ by? 2. And so that 2 that is right here is everything. This tells me that we're dealing with an arithmetic sequence. Now when we look at the question that is being asked, what we want to do is say, how many students can sit in the last row? So we're not looking for the sum. What we're looking for is just the final term of the sequence. So that is my nth term formula. That's a sub n is equal to a1 plus n minus 1d. And if we know the last row is row what, row what, row? 26. Then that means we're looking for a sub 26. And most assuredly, you and I know the first term. It's what? It's? 8. 8. Very good. And then plus n minus 1 times the common difference. And the common difference, we know, it's what? It's? It's 2. It's 2. Very good. So let me go ahead and write that in. And I'm just going to substitute in what number for n? Uh, 26. 26. So how many students sit in the 26th row? 8 plus 26 minus 1 times 2. That's a quick enough calculation. 26 minus 1 is a... Uh, 25. Double it. 50. Add 8. 58. 58 students sit in that very last row. That's part A. I'll label it. For part B... We want to know what? Well, for part B, what we want to know is how many students can this room hold? So when I add up all those chairs, presuming there's a student in each chair, mm -hmm. 
how many students will be in the room, that's a sum. We know our sum formula. Our sum formula is n over 2 times a1 plus a n. Now, n is the number of terms in the sequence. We know how many terms are in the sequence. That's the number of rows. That's what? That's uh, 26. 26. We most assuredly know the first term. That's what? That's, That's 8. 8. And we just found the last term. That was what? That was? 58. 58. So it looks like when we take a look at s sub n, it's now s sub 26, the sum of those 26 terms. That's going to be equal to n over 2, 26 times 2, times a1. a1 is the first term, plus a n, and that would be the last term. So half of 26 is what? Half of 26 is? 13. Six, or 8 and 50, 8 added up is? Uh, 66. And 13 times 66 is the number of students in the room. What would that be? Uh, 858. Beautiful. Thank you. A five-year-old child receives an allowance of $1 each week. His parents promise him an annual increase of $2 per week. Let's write a formula for the child's weekly allowance in a given year. And what will the child's allowance be when he is 16 years old? Well, the formula is going to represent we'll call the formula AN, the sequence, the child's weekly allowance in a given year. So let N be the number of years since the child was five. Number of years since the child was five. So that means if I go ahead and think about what the terms of the sequence would look like, a sub zero, zero years since the child was five, would be the weekly allowance. And that's one, isn't it? A sub one would represent the allowance one year later when the child was six. And that would be one plus, and then we'll have to add that constant increase of two dollars per week. A sub two, that would be the allowance two years since that child was five. So that would be one plus two times two. In other words, another two thrown in there. And I can see a formula start to be, I can see a formula being evolved. What is the formula that I see? Well, if I continue, I see a sub n is equal to one plus two times n. And this follows our mold of what an arithmetic sequence should look like. Arithmetic sequence could be written as the first term plus the common difference times the number of terms. Here my common difference is a 2 because the allowance is increasing $2 per week and my first term is 1, that very first allowance for the child. Now for part B I want to know what will the child's allowance be when he or she is 16 years old? Well, 16 years old means that I'm looking at how many years since the child was 5. That'd be 11. So we're looking at the 11th term of the sequence. a sub 11 is equal to 1 plus 2 times 11. So that 11th term would be 1 plus 22, which is 23. What does that mean? Well, that means what will the child's allowance be when he is 16 years old? That allowance will be $23 per week when he is 16. Identify arithmetic sequences. Our goal is just that. If you have a sequence, is it arithmetic? What's an arithmetic sequence? Well, it has a property that the difference between any two consecutive terms is constant. And this common difference is called D, or it's given by the letter D. Well, what we do is we go ahead and take a look at our terms and see if we can identify that common difference. So if I take a look at 5, 7, 9, 
I think it's pretty clear that each term differs by what? Each term differs by? By two. By two. Five plus two is seven, and seven plus two is nine. So if I can identify my common difference, I have an arithmetic sequence. That's it, kind of. Because what we do is we give you sequences and we have different operations. Now, now we're always adding and saying what number we're we adding from one term to get to the next, but by different operations, what I mean by this is that when I look at 150, 148, 146, 144, 142, I think subtraction. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what number do I add to 150 to get to 148? From negative two? What number do I add to 148 to get to 146? Negative two. And does that negative two persist as the number that I add to get from one term to the next? Yes. Yes. So my common difference is negative two, and I have an arithmetic sequence. If that common difference exists, you have an arithmetic uh, sequence. If that number d does not exist, if there's one term, so when you add by that same number, you don't get the next term, it's not an arithmetic sequence. Is each sequence arithmetic? If so, find the common difference. Well, start with the four. What would I need to add to get to the seven? Three. What would I need to add to the seven to get to the 10? Three. Well, sure looks like I'm adding the same number from one term to get to the next term. That common difference is? Three. Is it an arithmetic sequence? Yes. Yes, it is. Here, I say, what number do I add to four to get to negative seven? I mean, your mind kind of goes to subtraction, but what are you actually adding? Um, you're adding negative 11. Wow, very good. Now for the harder question, what number do you add to negative seven to get to 10? And 17. 17, <laughs> that's actually very good. I was gonna say, if, if you don't wanna do that calculation, you can always just take negative seven minus 11 and recognize that you don't get to the 10. But you, but you knew it was 17, which is even better. So is negative 11 17? No. No, it's almost like a trick question. <laughs> so is there a common difference? No. No. Is this an arithmetic sequence? No. No. Thank you. Identify sequences that are geometric. We're given a sequence. We want to know, is it geometric? Well, a geometric sequence is one in which any term divided by the previous term is a constant. And this constant is called a con common ratio. And so that common ratio has to be there. If I go ahead and look at two terms and divide the latter by the former, the second term by the first, I get a two. If I divide the latter by the former, if I divide 20 by 10, I get a two. That two is my common ratio. If the common ratio exists, you have a geometric sequence, and if it doesn't, you don't. In this case, that common ratio was pretty clear right off the bat. You can almost see 5 times 2 is 10, and 10 times 2 is 20. Now, maybe not so clear, but it's the same thought process. Is this sequence geometric? Absolutely. Why? There's a common ratio. How do I know? Well, take out your calculator. Take any term and divide by the preceding one. 110 divided by 100. What would that be? 1.1. 1. 1. Okay. Then go ahead and take 121, divide it by 110. What would that be? 1.1. 1. 1. Then go ahead and take 133.1, divide it by the preceding term, which is 121. Excuse me. 1.1. Uh, 1. 1. 1. 1. Very good. And finally, you take the next term, 146.41, divide it by the preceding term, 133.1. I'm going to take a stab in the dark here, but is it 1.1? 1. 1? Yep. If my common ratio does exist, I have a geometric sequence. So that's all you do to check for a geometric sequence. You go ahead and take a look at two consecutive terms, and you divide the former by the latter. In other words, if I go ahead and say, is this sequence geometric? I'll start with the negative 48 because that comes after the 120. I'll take negative 48 time divided by 120 and what do I get? Negative 0.4. Very good. Let's see if I get the exact same value when I take 
19.2 and divide it by negative 48. What do you get? I got negative 0.4. Beautiful. So there's my common ratio. If I took 120 and multiplied it by negative 0.4, I'd get negative 48. If I took negative 48 and multiplied it by negative 0.4, I'd get 19.2. I have a geometric sequence. How about the next sequence? Well, we'll go ahead and do the same thing. Take the 12, divide it by the 120. What do we get? 0 0.1. 0 0.1. So 120 times 0.1 is 12. My common ratio, I'm hoping, is 0.1. So I would take 1 and divide it by 12, right? Yeah. And what would I get? Uh, I got 0 0.0833 repeating. Ah, so do I end up getting back that same value? No. I, no, I don't. 12 times 0 0.1 isn't 1. So I have no common ratio. Is my sequence geometric? No. No. Thank you. Is this sequence geometric? And if so, find the common ratio. For a sequence to be geometric, this means it has a common ratio. So if I take any term and divide it by the preceding term, I should get the same number for any other term divided by its preceding number. So if I take 2 and divide by the number that comes before it, which is 1, I get back a 2. This should be equal to a different term, 4, divided by the number that comes before it, which is a 2. And notice I still get back a 2. In fact, for any given term, say 8, if I divide by the number that comes before it, which in this case is 4, I still get back 2. 16 divided by 8 is 2. So, is the sequence for part A geometric? Yes. What is the common ratio? Well, the common ratio would be 2. Now, for the second sequence, I'll take any term like the 12, divided by the term before it, the preceding term, 48. And when I take 12 and divide by 48, 12 goes into 48 four times, and that's one-fourth. So go to some other term, like the 4, divide by the preceding term, 12. 4 divided by 12, well, that's one-third. I can stop at that point. I know that I do not have a common ratio because these two numbers here are not equal. So is this sequence geometric? No. Let's write a recursive formula for the geometric sequence shown below, whose terms are 6, 9, 13.5, 20.25, and so on. Now the recursive formula for a geometric sequence with a common ratio r is given by a sub 1, so we'll specify the first term, And then to generate the remaining terms, a sub n is going to be equal to r times a to the n minus 1, which is the previous term. And we'll do this when n is greater than or equal to 2. Now, I know my first term, a sub 1 is equal to 6. So this immediately becomes a part of my recursive formula. Next thing I have to do is to find the common ratio. To find the common ratio, I take any two consecutive terms and I divide so that the preceding term is in the denominator. So in this case, I'll take 9 divided by 6 and I get 1.5. This is my common ratio. My common ratio is 1.5. So that means that the remaining portion of my recursive formula is a sub n is equal to 1.5 times a sub n minus 1. This is for values of n that are greater than or equal to 2. Here is my recursive formula for the geometric sequence shown. Given a geometric sequence with a sub 1 equal 3 and a sub 4 equal 24, let's find a sub 2. So I know the general form for an explicit sequence for a geometric sequence, and that would be a sub n is equal to a sub 1 r to the n minus 1. Now what do I know? Well, I, I do know what a sub 1 is. 
a sub 1 is 3. What I don't know is what r is. So I have to find that. So what I could do is I could use this formula that I have for my geometric sequence and say to myself, since I have my fourth term, a sub 4, that's equal to my first term times r to the n minus 1. Now I know the fourth term is 24. I know the first term is 3. I'll multiply by r and n I know is what? n is 4. So I have enough information to find the common ratio. I know 24 is equal to 3 times r cubed and if I divide both sides of the equation by 3 then I have 8 is equal to r cubed and if I take a cube root of both sides of the equation I find my common ratio to be 2. Alright, so now I know I'm going to go ahead and place a 2 in for the common ratio. So my geometric sequence may be given by a sub n is equal to, let's make those substitutions, we have 3 times 2 to the n minus 1. We're looking for a sub 2, so when n is 2, I'm looking for a sub 2, when n is 2 I have 3 times 2 to the 2 minus 1. And that's 3 times 2 which is 6. My second term is 6. Write formulas for the nth term of geometric sequences and find indicated terms. So what we're going to do is give you the terms of a geometric sequence and you come up with the actual formula for the nth term. And we know some stuff. For example, we know the formula is a sub n is equal to a sub 1 r to the n minus 1. Where a sub n, this is the nth term, a sub 1, this is my first term, r, this is my common ratio, and that will have to, find, have to find it by dividing a term by the term before it, and n, well n is just nothing more than the variable. So when I go ahead and take a look at what we have, if I write down a sub n is equal to a sub 1 r to the n minus 1, my first term is a sub 1, that's what, that's? That's 3. 3. To find the common ratio, I take the 6 divided by the number that's before it, and I just double check. I take the 12 and divide it by the number that's before it. It sure looks like my common ratio is 2, two because that's the number I would multiply the 3 by to get to the 6. I'd multiply the 6 by to get to the 12. So that 2 goes where? It goes with the r. With the r. So we have a sub n is equal to 3 times the common ratio 2 raised to the n minus 1. And though I don't want to do this all the way through, this is checkable. Is that a word, checkable? <laughs> I don't know. I think it is. Let's check it. Let's look at the third term. We would have 3 times 2 to the 3 minus 1. And that's 3 times 2 squared. And that most assuredly is 12. So we can check these if we choose to. So let's go ahead and see if we can find the nth term and then find the seventh term. So I always begin by writing a sub n is equal to a sub 1 r to the n minus 1. I'm going to double check that I really do have a geometric sequence. So I'm going to take the 50 and divide it by the term before it. 50 divided by 10 is what? It's 5. 5. And then do you see where I'm going with this? 250 divided by what? Divided by? Divided by 50. Is? 5. So that means to get from 10 to 50, I multiply by 5. To get from 50 to 250, I multiply by 5. Bam. Common ratio. So I'm not going to write bam, but I will write the common ratio, <laughs> which is 5. What's the first term? First term is? 10. 10. There's my formula. A sub n is equal to what? It's equal to? 10 times 5. Beautiful. Raised to the n minus 1. It's like reading an answer key. That's great. So if I want to find which term? If I want to find which term? If I want to find the? The seventh term? Seventh term, I'd write a sub 7 is equal to 10 times 5 to the 7 minus 1, which would be 10 times 5 to the what? To the? To the sixth. Take out your calculator. What is 10 times 5 raised to the sixth? I got 156,250. Very good. Let's look at two more. Let's find the nth term here. 
and then find the seventh term. Check out if we really have a geometric sequence. Take the four divided by what? Divided by? 16. That's what? That's? One fourth. And then take the one and divide it by four and get? One fourth. One fourth. We have a common ratio. So we can move forward. A sub n is a sub one, r to the n minus one. So now we're dealing with a common ratio that's a fraction. That's, that's a fraction. That's, that's what? That's? That's one fourth. And the first term, which is what? Which is? 16. 16. So my nth term is a sub one, which is what? Which is? 16. Times r, which is? One fourth. Raised to the what? Raised to the n minus one. Beautiful. That's the nth term. That's this thing here. To find the seventh term, all I'm going to do, got to color code it, okay? All I'm going <laughs> to do is I'm going to go ahead and substitute in a seven to find the seventh term. That's 16 times one fourth to the seven minus one. That's 16 times one fourth to the what? To the? To the sixth. To the sixth. What would that be? Um, and I, I could be clever. I can go four squared over four to the sixth. And so that's the same as one over four to the fourth. But what do you end up getting back? What is four to the fourth, by the way? Um, she says, you're asking too many questions. I hope you mind. What's four to the fourth? 256. That's how we'll write our answer. Very good. So to find the nth term, we find the first term in the common ratio, and then we can use it to find any specified term. Thank you. Let's write an explicit formula for the nth term of the following geometric sequence, 2, 10, 50, 250, and so on. The explicit formula for the nth term would be a n is equal to a 1 times r raised to the n minus 1. We call the input as n, and the output is a n. So this means we need to find the common ratio, and we need to find the first term. Because we do have a geometric sequence, I can take any two consecutive terms, and I can divide. So I'll take 50 divided by 10. This is 5. This is my common ratio. So I'll go ahead and substitute in a 5 for r. For the first term, well, my first term is 2. I will substitute in a 2 for a1. That means my explicit formula is a n is equal to a1 times r, which is 5 raised to the n minus 1. Here is my explicit formula for the nth term of a geometric sequence.